Good afternoon. I don't think. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to see so many friends here this afternoon and to feel, I think, a real energy and excitement about our reading and conversation. So in order to make it even more wonderful, please make sure you've turned off your cell phones. And I should share with you that poor Eileen has been struggling with the fact that their phone seems to not accept Santa Barbara wavelengths. So it's, they had to negotiate and navigate how to get here by stopping at McDonald's and asking for directions. So um, I really appreciate the persistence and the passion to, to be together on everyone's part. So my name is Patsy Hicks, and I'm Director of Education here at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. And this afternoon, we welcome acclaimed poet, novelist, performer, and art journalist, Eileen Miles, whose practice of vernacular first-person writing has made them one of the most recognized writers of their generation. The author of more than 20 books, some of which you saw as you came in, and they are very kind to agree to do a signing afterwards, include A Working Life, For Now, Evolution, Afterglow, A Dog Memoir, and Chelsea Girls. They bring to our consideration the ideas of identity, vocation, language, and place, also present in the exhibition upstairs entitled Inside, Outside. Miles' many honors include four Lambda Literary Awards, the Clark Prize for Excellence in Arts Writing, the Shelley Memorial Award from the Poetry Society of America, Creative Capital's Literature Award, as well as their Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant and a Foundation for Contemporary Arts Grant. They will be in conversation with fiction writer and interdisciplinary literary and cultural studies scholar Samir Pandya, no stranger to this stage, we're delighted to say. His own writing in navigating the sometimes difficult space of the semi-outsider allows us to have the kinds of conversations needed to create change. We look forward to such a conversation this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming Eileen Miles and Samir Pandya. Hi, and thank you for coming. Thanks for being here. Um, it's good to take your clothes off before you read. <laughs> so I'm going to, I think I'm going to read. Um, I'm going to read, I'm going to read an essay first about reading, I think, and then some poems. Um, poems from a new book and then some poems that are even newer than that. Um, this is called Perverse Reading. The thing I will say about being young is I hated it. I wasn't anybody. I was broke. My apartment was a mess. I shouldn't drink so much. I only stopped criticizing my body when I was doing drugs. And the thing I liked about the act of reading is that my body would get lost and I would go someplace else. The thing I didn't think so much about was the pages. So many of them and turning, turning all the time as the moments passed and I was free. If I liked a song, I would play it again and again. It didn't even strike me as peculiar. I remember one song that made me feel so elevated when I listened to it that I just became this other person I called a Rococo Wanderer. And she just roamed around in a bodiless way on the face of the earth and saw things. The turning of the record created that. The black disc making, turning, making time and mind. I was dreaming. And the record was a chant, though a petrochemical, electrical one. It required I pay my bill, which I mostly did. But I hated paying my bills, and I hated doing dishes. I hate cleaning the cat litter again and again. I hated going down the stairs in my building. And I hated going up. I hated the subway. I hated doing my laundry. Though I liked watching it going around and around once it was in, and I could sit on the wooden bench dreaming. 
I hated holidays. I hated them coming again, thinking of last year, my family wanting me back, and the compulsiveness with which I went to them. I had liked going to confession when I was a practicing Catholic. I liked the relief. Though I confessed the same poems, sins, again and again. And when I said something different, it got weird. Suddenly it was about him, the priest, rather than the, the previous no one, by doing nothing, getting wiped clean. I stopped going. I started going to therapy about five years ago. I meant to go slightly before, but instead I got in a relationship, and mostly in therapy we talked about her. But my therapist pronounced her name funny, kind of misgendering her, and I liked that. But he always forgot to use my correct pronoun, which I didn't like. When she was gone, we talked about me, and we arrived up on the great topic, which is the return. I've concluded that the reason rock stars die young is that they didn't want to do it. I did. I came in saying the reason I had come was this feeling I had that I was turning a corner and I wanted help with that. My therapist would remind me that turning a corner was my request when I came to him, and instead we had spent three or four years talking about her. It made me dislike her, though I certainly thought that was my definition of a relationship. Being obsessed... And if I were a whiteboard, it would be about wiping me out daily and writing in her. We got to it in the aftermath of her, and it's this. He said, this point in my life, and he meant late. I'm fairly late in the day. I'm, I think I'm like a rambunctious evening in which you may or may not go out. But you've done everything before. Some things a lot and other things not enough. And he was like, what is it you haven't done enough of? And that's a big open spot, and though I like to confess all, I want, what I want to say is that that spot is, and I, can f and I can fill it, and that's what I'm doing right now. I remember watching Julian Beck cut vegetables in the kitchen with a good knife on a cutting board. That was a film, and he was very important to the person who gave me the film, not so much to me, but that scene has stayed with me all my life. I dream that someone has a camera and follows me in the morning. It's like the Walter Mosley book I found on the sidewalk one night on the corner. It was bent, having just fallen out of someone's back pocket. I read it, feeling in love with the randomness of the gift. I hope the camera never comes, but I like the sensation of being alone with the thought. It's how I have a soul. And my dog has a soul, too. Her soul wants to take the same walk again and again. We are lying in bed, and the thing that makes the day start happens. I'm mostly happy if I fell asleep reading, or that was the last thing I did, turning pages rather than foisting all that electronic light into my brain. I fell asleep dull and in the private world of my book. Okay, I might as well get up, and it could be six, but it's most likely eight. I stick my glasses on and my phone into the pockets of my pajamas. I go into the kitchen and look out the window and see the light, and then I put the water on. There might be dishes in the sink. My ex used to be passionate about cleaning the kitchen at night, and I brought that regime into my life for a while, and indeed the emptiness of the clean kitchen felt great, but I don't have to do that. And I'll wipe a knife or a spoon while the water's boiling. About two years ago, I stopped drinking coffee and moved to green tea. It's a softer high and better for ritual. It's full of ritual, like a cigarette. The water boils, and I cool it for two minutes, and then I pour it into the kusu. Then I wait two and a half minutes and drink that tea, and then I do it again. The second time, it steeps for three minutes. There's a third infusion, but I generally wait and drink that later in the day. I'm doing that right now. I just want to say, as I watch my numbers shrinking, and I mean that this piece was commissioned by somebody, and it could only be so many words, as I, watch, as I watch my numbers shrinking, this piece is only so long, and that all the things that destroyed me in life, the horror of dailiness I experience now with this neglectful respect. Perverse reading again and again, I find. I think of the hot day in summer many years ago in New York. I was living upstate, so I was in Manhattan in hot fucking... August, August, <laughs> August, doing errands, and it was hell. 
I'm walking down St. Mark's Place in a pile of anxious dread, and I had the thought, it will always be like this. And it was cool. It was like air conditioning. Everything, everything was cooling. And with notable exception, like I do fall into a pit, but this is pretty much my life. This condemned dailiness, cutting, cleaning, jumping on the subway, going around and around, being watched, and there's no one there at all. And the dog nods because she wants her walk, that walk, and we do it every day. And every day is exactly the same, but different. I'm on a plane, and I've done this before. Listen, feel the lift. It was weird. I was in Berlin, actually like twice last spring, and I, this guy was listening to the things I was saying in between poems, and he was like, would you write about that? And I was like, oh, I don't know. And then, and then I realized I ought to do it, and I wrote it. And then strangely, for some reason, we've completely disconnected, and he's never published the piece. But he made me write it. It was kind of <laughs> great. Um, so this is the first poem in this book, and it's called For My Friend. And this friend of, I mean, it's sort of ludicrous. This friend of mine was kind of interested or in love with somebody. And I was, I was giving her advice, which was so absurd. Um, nothing better for people than dogs. Nothing better than making you scream here. There were two super new cars and then some pink chicken fillets. I guess there were berries for sale in Scandinavia. A man in a plaid shirt and cookies also there working in the cemetery. I can see their blue ladder from here. A man has written a book about many deaths or many things to do after. Read it, read it, they say. But what comes after is a small idea. Now is large, rainy. Amy, I wish you luck. And this one's longer. It's called March 3rd. And it was um, in New York. We, um, we had a, like a giant snowstorm a few years ago, and, um, and the city was just completely out of control. So the next snowstorm coming, the mayor quickly closed the city in advance of it, and then we didn't get the storm, which was so great. Because it was like, it was actually the last semester I've taught in college. And um, it was like a snow day. It was really fun. But a no snow day. I just stayed in bed. So this is March 3rd. The quick exchange of emails between the former lovers creates a soft hole in the day and the night before. It snowed, but it was supposed to be larger, and everything's closed. The streets are wet, I hear, and I won't step into them. One poem for today, but no, many little ones. The coffee slightly altered is good, my bare feet in bed ready to work. I work in the field of dreams where I have met you many times. I feel closer to you this morning and probably last night when the doorway slightly opened because of our notes was flutter with ghosts. When I was young, I liked the emptiness of my home and now, like it or not, there was this sweet accumulation. The cameras, all that everything I do can't touch the single statement of breeze and loss and quaint beauty, things I've had since I was a kid. The secrets of my home. I feel condemned by this chaotic museum of stuff, and yes, I desire to photograph it, the bowls you liked, the cup you touched, and me in a t-shirt that used to be special, and now I carouse in bed with myself in it. I don't know if this will ever be different, and that is the feeling of this. I feel like a tree, the invisible part of friendship and drinking together and warning. One empty wall is the least I can do for myself. Late at night, I enjoy the brown pages of a cowboy show, TV on my lap till practically dawn, interesting, written by a gambler. Oh, I have so many shows. One in Florence one day, you were taking a shower. I think I thought I love this television because it's become the way to love. The road of becoming is a screen belonging on it in my dream. The excellent moments, the man bodges in and says, do you ever think about film? The poetry of accident haunts like a circus tent over my days, and that fades in a new one. I begin to write about dying. This story ends. It begins to be part of the plot. And do I love you for your distance from it? Or could I love you because you are close or your exciting difference so smart? I love myself. The squeaky little voice that says, in here, owning the void and grooving on it. Voice over, you're not so bad. And then I begin to work. 
My dead mother is around, my lover not far, keeping you here by not calling anyone. Is that the tub in which I die? Weirdo. Woo, woo, woo. What's that bird? Because I don't have kids, and this is such a blessing. And this one's called, what's it called? Lucky Kittens. It's a good band name, right? I was like, my, my mother did die in 2017, and she's such an obsession now. It was like, I mean, you know, she's my mother. I was always kind of attached to her, but um, now she's like a star, you know? I like, I think about her a lot. And she got a lot of, Real estate in this book of poetry. Um, Lucky kittens, I met something cool and I can't shake it. I want to write a poem to the new thing. Nothing more trans than taking a shit in the men's room in a hotel. Also, I had a perfect breakfast and am well. I exercised all good things. And once again, I'm flying. A world without mother is a world without meat. I'm not crying, I'm flying. Honestly, I took my mother's tear from the corner of her eye. It happened when she died. I took it on my finger and I wiped it on my jeans. The rattling of paper is a, an exquisite disconnect. Old-fashioned, all breaks, making space, always ready for a fight. My heat is instantly shadowy like a moving hand or sound, like no jazz at all. And this poem, I got this is... Because this is an arts institution, I think this is really a good one to read here. Um, where is it? It's called a library. And um, PS New York, it used to be PS 122, and now it's PS New York. But um, they were doing an art auction. And so they, um, you know, I've been involved with them off and on for years. So they were like, would you donate something to the art auction? I was like, okay. And I thought, okay, how about if I, I, I don't, I, I'll donate a poem for a dog, a dog poem. Like, so somebody, if somebody wants a poem for their dog, I will write that poem. And so they were like, okay. And somebody paid $5,000 for my poem. I was like, whoa. So I was like, I said, that's, you know, in fact, they didn't, I didn't learn this until later, but I just knew that somebody wanted the poem. So then I had to go to the person's incredible um, high rise apartment in Chelsea with this amazing art collection and meet their two newfies, Penny and Paisley. And then go out, you know, I couldn't write about the dogs unless I met them, so I go out for a walk with the dogs and, and, and get their special bre breakfast treat and it was the whole thing. And so that was great. And then I had the, I mean, I, I had never, I was invited to go to Greece where I'd never been before, so I went to Greece and I pretty much forgot about the dog poem. And I get this email, where's my dog poem? I was like, oh, okay. So, so I write it, you know, weeks pass, but I write the dog poem and then I send it to them and then I don't hear anything back. And then I sent it to them again, and I, I, I have never heard anything back from there. So this, I, this is their dog poem. I just want you to love it up a little bit. It's called, it's called a library. Penny and Paisley study maps. Penny and Paisley abhor literature. Penny and Paisley wear hats. Paisley's got a bushy foot, wavy back. Penny's very thirsty camping over the bowl or the water like a platypus, just like that. Like literature, like a library. She's a beautiful mass. She just sits there. Paisley lifts her telescope at the Acropolis, at the bay. Ears lost in her brownness, wiggle wave, huff, huff. Penny and Paisley at the deli. Three paradise, please. Three seasoned sausage and egg. I love ruins, says Penny. Just get the sandwiches, says Paisley. Remember the dead. Every mountain in Greece is named after St. Elias. Remember him. Get me a sandwich. Day. Bay. My breathing is like the chug of a train. Forward always, says Penny. Lobby in, lobby out. Get me a boat. Penny and Paisley are sailing. Dusk falling on the ruins, on Shelter Island, on the sea. Penny and Paisley are singing as the light falls, as the sandwich warm on the deck of the boat, as the dogs dive in and splash around and they're turning to see what you see at sea, they sing. And the sun warms the dog and the dog warms the egg and the egg warms the sea and the sea warms the day. Penny and Paisley are sailing as they're swaying down the street and the dogs wrote a book and the dogs went to bed and the dogs had a day. That's just what it said. <laughs> right? it's like 
could probably. I could probably sell it again, right, for another 5,000. It was like, it's your, I'll just change the dog's names. And it was just like, oh, what are we doing? Oh, I'm, I, I'm almost done, believe it or not. Okay, I'm gonna read a poem called Diet Coke, and then I'll read a couple of new ones. Um, I am kind of focusing on art. I can't help it. I mean, we love art, right? Where is it? The hell is it? Okay, Diet Coke says, recycle me. I took, I took the dog on the subway today, and today I have an alarm on my phone called Joan Mitchell. And later on, later on tonight, I said I'd be joning. This dog sees everything on Second Ave, not far historically from where Robert Homs met Joan Mitchell in the apartment of Joe Lesseur right over there. I think of buildings collapsing. I'm having a slice nearby. At the party, everyone's laughing. I said, I'm boning Joan tonight. I'm boning up on Joan Mitchell for the Famous Woman Artist podcast. Honey badly wants a bite. The light just changed. It's bright. The kind of Stefan Grappelli violin playing, well, bicycles pass. Matthew said, I would have sobbed the end was so good if I had authentic feelings. We laugh. I just spent an hour zooming with my shrink, the parade of exes in Provincetown. The man in the orange cap walking away, I would cry if I wasn't so damn joyous. He's lowering the awning on the pizza shop, but these feelings just won't go away. Let me read a couple of new poems, and then, and then we're going to talk. You know, I just have to say, I have just have to say this is really, it's very beautiful here today, and it's beautiful in, um, in Santa Barbara. And, um, and I think I, I know that we all know that it's, there, there's, the power is out in Gaza. It's completely dark, and people, and they have no, they have no internet, and they can't call for help, and they're being bombed, and it's just, I, I, I feel like, I feel like it's wrong. I just feel it's wrong. And I feel like I, I don't want my government to pay for it. I don't want my government to, I mean, violence is wrong. It's all wrong, you know? None of us should be happening. But I feel like we're paying for it. And it's, it's, it's insane. It's insane. And it hurts. Um, there's a, there's a, this, I'm completely going to change. Well, actually, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go once hard poem and then one well they're all they're all hard and easy at the same time I guess um, okay this one's called warm mountains and and I you know I often write poems while I'm in a plane well I'm perched over Paris I want to say hello the camera on the plane pulls back and now it's looking on the ocean and then it list of names. The Pyrenees, actually there's, there's two animal poems and I think I'm gonna read the other one, sorry. <laughs> this is a great, I'll read it to you afterwards if you like or I'll email it to you. Um, this one is called Ginger Ale. You don't wanna think about chickens going over London. Millions of chickens opening their eyes for one second, waking up in a cage, no, in a wide field of tiny chickens like a mile wide tray and they get these chemicals on their feet. That's the only way I can imagine it, filled with sex drug that makes them wild, distorted, crippled. And how do they kill the chickens all at once? Where did chickens come from anyway? Some chickens wake up in, an, in some nice place, like in Leslie's, at Leslie's, where they live for a while having friends in her yard with their different personalities, but the millions and trillions of the other kind, one flash of light, then they're eaten on a plane, we're flying and we're eating them. And aren't they birds? And the plane is going over water now, a plane full of killers, desperately looking for something good with their fingers, but there's nothing good. How could there be? The chicken's death is not on your hands. Something else is. Um, who? And would you like to hear one more poem? I mean, you kind of, I had him have you over a barrel. You were like, no, <laughs> shut up. Um, 
So just to quickly say that the a controversy in the poetry world or, or everywhere is AI, of course, and there, there very recently was a, um, an AI book of poetry was published, and, um, and these guys got more for this book in, a, in advance from Little Brown than, than 75 poets put together. It's insane. And, um, and so these guys got in touch with me, and they were like, and I think Sharon Olds and a handful of very different poets, and wanted us to look at the poetry book and say what we thought about it. And I was like, oh, come on. You know, but it so happened that all these things happened very quickly. Like I have a, I have a Prius, basically for the purpose of driving my dog to Texas, and and the day I was to leave, the car wouldn't go. And it turned out because of the restaurant shacks in New York, rats have been getting under the hoods of cars, and they particularly they bring in their chicken bones, and then when they're finished with their chicken, they eat the soy wires of a Prius, and so they had devoured the inside of my car, so I couldn't go, and then my dog had surgery. All these things happened, and then I got a ticket, like a big ticket. So I said to them, I said, well, I'll, yeah, okay, if you, pay my, if you pay my ticket in cash, I will come and talk to you about your book. And so he was like, okay, but can I, talk, can I say that in the introduction? I was like, fine. So this is called Feeder. The embodiment of the poet is the point, and that's why it's okay for you to pay my parking ticket, and especially to pay it in cash. Not because of the cute anecdote about the car and the rats and the rental and the dog surgery and parking in front of the hydrant and getting towed and paying a ticket for that, and you paid it. I will pay the ticket on my computer, but I will buy food with your cash. It's why nobody likes to support poetry. They'll just use it to pay their rent, which is right. Survival. Oh, my God. It's, hold on, just hold that thought. I don't know, something wild happened up here. I, I mean, I kind of know it, but I don't really know it, and you want it to be perfect. Survival, keep the word survival in your mind. Survival, survival is my art. A violent act it is. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, you did that. Hey, are we on? Yes. Yes, here yes. we're on. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, you are. Thank you for this. Yes. Um, you're very funny. It's it's sad to say, but it's true. Yeah. So can I? You know, can we talk about can we talk about funny? And, yes. Yeah. And and, yeah. and and I guess I want to I want you to talk to us about kind of what it is as a a thing. Uh -huh. But I think maybe the first question I want to ask is: Do you think of yourself as a funny writer? I don't intend to be funny, but I think that people laugh, and people often laugh at things that I hadn't realized were funny. So, but then sometimes I write, when I'm writing, I'm laughing, and I think, oh, this is funny, you know? <laughs> and often the, what motivates me to write is I, I think of something that I think is funny, and then I think, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run with that, you know, because it, it gives you energy, you know? If you know that there's something implicitly absurd about this thing, it just, it's very motivating, I think. And so, like, when you're reading, is there a, a moment where you think, oh, this is where I'm going to get the laughter? Are there, I guess, oh, what well, I'm, I... Yeah, yeah, I guess, you know, when you put the reading together, because, I, you know, I read that long one, and it was a snowy day and, and stuff, and it's got a little melancholy, a very mortal poem, and ex-lover and all that stuff, and it was like, Penny, bring in the dogs, bring in Penny and Paisley. Right. Now, you know, because it changes, changes the energy. And I do feel like a, a reading, a presentation is like doing yoga. You know, you do this and then you do that, you know, and you just want to keep it um, shifting so that, that I don't get bored, you don't get bored, yeah. you know. So I guess in the other piece of this is that then what is the surprise when people are laughing at things in some ways that you didn't intend for them to laugh at? Uh, the question is, what is... What, what, like, what ha I mean, in a way that there are moments where well, you're expecting them to laugh. What happens when they're laughing at things that you're not expecting them to laugh that's at? That's exactly why I am able to do this, because that's how it began, right? Anybody who was like a class clown didn't mean to be funny. <laughs> it was just, you know what I mean? You were kind of bullied. You know, I was like a terrible little tomboy in Catholic school. I had... Um, broken front teeth, and, and, um, and I lived, I grew up in the 50s and 60s when um, 
I love my kind of Annie Oakley pigtails, but every mother that I knew was making their daughters cut their hair and get these perms. And so I had like fuzzy hair, broken front teeth, and I kind of walked. And I was just like, I was like an awkward kid, you know? And so I think that, but I did realize I could make people laugh and that felt powerful. Because yeah. then I was fending off pain, I think. So, almost, I mean, both as a form of defense as well. Yeah, yeah, taking space before yeah. they take it, yeah. I think. Um, so, you know, when Patsy asked me to do this, I was very excited. I know Chelsea girls really well. I know the poetry really well. And then, of course, I looked at a working life, and, you know, there's that page where there's a list of books, right? There are 24 books oh, yeah. listed yeah. there. That's 24 is an incredible number of books. Mm -hmm. And I think the first question I had is that there's a way in which when you're writing books, um, you construct yourself in the book, right? If it's autobiographical or not autobiographical, you, you as a writer, you appear in the book, right? In, in different kinds of ways where you can look at the book and say, this is me in my everyday life. This is the person I constructed in the book. My first question about that is, so how is the Eileen Miles that has been constructed in these books changed over the course of these 24, 23, 24 books that you've written? Oh. Well, I think, um, and I wonder what this is like for you. The, I'm guessing that people know my work somewhat. Maybe not, maybe you just like the museum and you come for whatever's here. So this might be like, I don't know what this question is about. You know? <laughs> but I guess, the, buy my books. You yeah. know. It's, uh, there are lots of them, and they're all incredible. Yeah. But go ahead. But um, yeah, yeah, and I and I think it's it's hard because I think um, there was a great urgency. Like when I wrote Chelsea Girls when I was in my thirties, and maybe partially my. I mean, I, I wrote it over. I was a poet who wanted to write novels, and and I didn't know how to do it. And I basically, I mean, my thing about being like a poet that wants to write novels is you you have to make up a novel. Well, this is true for anybody. You have to make up a novel that you can write. You know, so I think you have to change the form so that you can succeed. So I've always thought it was, I mean, I think I went to Catholic schools. You're not supposed to write about yourself. You're not supposed to use I. And I always kept a diary and I always kept a journal. I always wrote and I wrote all, about all kinds of things. But, but I, I think that prohibition probably made I very attractive. And I, and I think I always did like first person narratives. They just seemed to have this quickening. I was interesting, you know, and it reminded me of movie magazines and reading about, you know, singers that I liked and actors and, you know, so it was pop, you know, it was, very, it was pop to write about yourself. And yet I always felt like I know that I always knew that the self I was writing was not me exactly. It was something like me. Like, I don't think my writing is, I would never, I've never called my writing autobiographical because for one thing, I didn't name me Eileen. That's a fiction, you know what I mean? Like my parents decided to call me Eileen and then Eileen Miles and I didn't, you know how it is, you don't like your name for years and then you think, no, it's a good name, you know? <laughs> but it's sort of like, it's, it's, it's something I feel a relative distance from and an intimacy too and I, so I think it's, so the character is always, I mean, I, I, I think a lot of us, especially if you're queer, the books that you want to exist don't exist. So you're, in a way, you're, all, you're doing this monumental thing, you're writing the book that you wish was there for you. You know, and so I had, you know, obviously I had heroes and people whose work, you know, Gertrude Stein, Jill Johnston, you know, there were a lot of people whose work was important to me coming up, but it's an approximation. So I think that, but the problem is when you do that for a long time, there's, there's a more known, I think I'm more, I feel more anonymous than ever in a certain way. You know, I think age does that to you. Like all the things, like I used to think like good eyesight was Eileen. You know, and then I was in my 40s and I got glasses and I was like, good eyesight is not Eileen, you know? And it's each thing that I thought was me in a, in a very personal identificatory way has proved to be untrue, you know? And then things that I don't think are me, like death, are me, will be me, you know? And so it, it seems like as you go along, it gets more anonymous. But I guess, so I don't even have a good way to get out of this question, but maybe I've gone far. <laughs> I've gone far enough, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, no, in that, I mean, it's interesting that it, in a way it's moving from whatever, from ego to non-ego, right? Or from where the pronoun I is so important, for example, in Chelsea Girls, yes. it becomes 
less so as you're continuing to write? I think I think so. Yeah, and I, and trying to figure out ways to make it lighter and more distance, but distant, but still um, exciting enough to make you want to read it. You yeah. know, but the eye is not doing the work necessarily. In the way that it had to early on, right? Yeah, for, that I wanted. Kind of... I want that I felt that was I was excited yeah. by it. Yeah, yeah. and then I it, needed it... to tell. I, I was so excited to tell these things, yeah. and now I'm not. <laughs> About yourself. Yeah, I mean, it was really fun. The essay I read was, I, I thought, it's, I thought, I'm thinking, well, what's fun about aging? You know, and I was like, I love boring shit now. I was just like, <laughs> Get, bring it on. You know, I love it. Yeah, which you know? is a and, great title for your next book. I love boring. Yeah. I love boring shit now. <laughs> um, so, you know, you said something, trying to connect both Chelsea girls, but then something you said about the poems, right? Where you said that my mother gets a lot of real estate in this book, uh-huh. right? In a way that I think in Chelsea Girls, your father gets a lot of real oh, estate. Oh, right, 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 right. And so yeah. I'm curious of like, I guess I want to hear about how one writes about their mother and father over a course of these books, right? Meaning that it, was there a necessary moment that kind of writing about the father needed to come first? or, Or is that way more random and way more kind of unclear than yeah. it seems to come out in the book. Well, it's as particular as they were, you know? Like, my dad died when I was 11. He was, so he was, he had all the force of obsession, mm-hmm. you know? And also, he was very, he was very generous to me. I was, you know, I was like, in our, fa- in the way families, my brother and sister were closer to my mother, and I was closer to my dad, and we were like, and we're both, I'm an alcoholic, my dad was an alcoholic, you know, I mean, like, we had a lot and caught me. he wanted to be a writer, you know, and he just was, he really supported my creativity, you know, and, but then, and he, he, and the house was rocked by his behavior and his alcoholism, and then he, he was 44 when he died, he died quite young, so it's just like, who was that guy, you know, so he was like a, a subject right away, and that was so interesting, and I, you know, and it was very exciting to, when I published Chelsea Girls, which was my first novel, I dedicated it to my dad, you know, and I've even written a book, I've written a book about my dog, my first dog, um, and there's a chapter in there called My Father Came Again as My, well, actually, how was, it? anyway, My Father Came Again as a Dog, because I felt like when I got my first dog, and I looked into her eyes, I thought, that's totally my father. He totally came back to be my dog, and it was a joke, but I also felt it, and it was amazing to write about my dog as a way, because I didn't, I mean, we don't, kids don't understand how to deal with death. It's impossible. You know, you don't know what it is. You keep trying to look sad and be sad and be tragic, but you're like a kid. You're just missing it, you know, because you don't know how to deal with that huge mystery, which is losing somebody, you know? And so it was incredible to live with the dog. I think that's probably why, part of why I'm so attached to animals. Like, I, I live with the dog. You can have a six animal life, you know, they have these little lives. You know, and so you keep, you know, you get a puppy and then you get an old dog. And it's such an intense thing to, and I, and I was so there for my dog. And so there was a way in which I felt like I lived, I, I realized something about my dad. So I really am done with that guy mm-hmm. in some way. Whereas my mother was always around. So I could only say so much about her, you know. <laughs> and now, <laughs> it was like, you know, I can love her and hate her at the depth of the, you know, the relationship. Um. In, in reference to Chelsea Girls, there's a quote I saw that I really appreciated you talking about the book. I think the quote is, prose that a poet could write. Uh-huh. Explain what that means in terms of kind of what you mean by that phrase, why kind of Chelsea Girls became that, that book out of that idea. Well, the sentences are funny, and they don't even fulfill the definition of sentence. In some cases, you know, but I think poets are sort of pointillist, you know, you just, you can have a one word line, you know, and prose can do that too, but people don't necessarily, don't do it as much as I might. And also the rhythm of one word lines and long lines and the rhythm, I mean, Virginia Woolf says it, she says it's not the words, it's the flow. And I think poets are very, very, very conscious of flow, you know, and so it was like using... I mean, like, I end paragraphs with the word that rhymes with something secretly inside of the paragraph. Like, I'm, I'm, it's like my, my novels, my prose is like epic poetry. I just never wrote an epic poem, you know? Mm. So um, there's, yeah, there's that. There's something else, but I can't remember what it 
what it is. Mm. Um, so I'm going to, I have a few more questions. I'm going to ask for about 10 more minutes. And then I'd love to kind of open it up for audience conversation, because I think that's also quite as fun in this conversation as well. Um, you know, in, in Patsy's introduction, she talked a little bit about identity, right? And kind of how it shapes your work. And I, I want to kind of ask you this question about it through just very briefly, just my own relationship to what that term means, right? Meaning that I came to this country, whatever, 40 years ago, right? And in that 40 year span, there is a American language around racial identity, mm -hmm. right? And the language I had, I didn't have much of a language as a kid, right? And as I've kind of grown up, I've had this different kind of language to think about what my particular kind of racial identity is, right? I'm bringing that up because I think in a way in the way in which your books get presented, right? The way in which they get marketed. Mm -hmm. There are a series of words that get associated with it, right? Yawn. You know you, yeah. you know this question is coming, but I have to ask it, yeah. right? So that there is lesbian poet and queer and the, this changing language. Punk, punk. Punk, yes, all, those are, and the, all of this language that is there, which is so fascinating to me because part of what it does is it makes it feel like, oh, they're bringing news from this other world, right? right. And, and that you become this sociological thing for them, right? right? And so can you talk about that? Can you talk about what bugs you about it? Or at least can you talk about how these kind of phrases have changed in your thinking and their uses or their lack of uses? Well, I just think the thing that's so funny is that like, even though somebody might say dyke or punk, what I think they're really talking about is class. You know, and of course, all those things are class, like being female is a class, right? It's sort of, um, so, so I think that's part of it. There's a, there's a kind of a, you, the, people don't know how to talk about class, so it's easier to use these buzzwords like punk or queer, you know, because then you sort of get it, you know, kind of funky, you know, or something, you know? But it's sort of, but it's, but it's so much more comp complicated. And of course, it's much more complicated, as we all know, um, the, the whole world of class, well, identity broadly, but also particularly in class, because it's like there is a there, there is a bit of there is a bit of a thing. The part of what you're saying is true. It's like there's a bit of a feeling that you're you're bringing something into prominence that wasn't there before, you know. And and people have very limited like there was a time when a couple of the stories in Chelsea Girls were going to make a, a film. And so somebody was watching somebody, like, there's nothing like a screenplay to see somebody take your work and rewrite it and completely get it wrong. And, and you know, because like there was a father in it and they had to turn him into an Archie Bunker racist because working class dads are all, you know, mean, racist, bully, alcohol. My dad was like a sissy, you know? I mean, it was just like each cliche was put back because people wouldn't be able to understand class or it just wasn't, it just didn't, you couldn't sell it as, as this kind of, um, this, comp this complicated thing that w is what reality is like, you know? So um, I don't, I, I can't, I'm not really doing really that well with this question, but I, I, I feel like, because I think too, a class is about a lot about language. And again, there's no one language of any particular class. It's sort of like, it's, it's like my mother, my mother's first language was Polish. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was born in this country, but she grew up in a Polish neighborhood in Cambridge. She learned Polish history. So she was very, her English was really good and she was very careful about English and she policed our English intensely. But the family next door were these, you know, big family, eight of them, they were, like, where my dad was a quiet alcoholic, their alcoholism was really loud. And they had dogs, and they went fishing, and they, they chased fire trucks. They did all this cool stuff, and I was attached to this family passionately, because they were like kids I read about in books. They were like Huck Finn, you know? And they would say bare naked and, and, just, and just crazy, you know? And I would just come into the house of this language. My mother was like, what? You know? But, but, but what I've become, as a writer, I became, because one of the things I learned, I went briefly to Queens College for 10 seconds, because this is one of the things we shared, you taught there, and I went there. And one of the classes I took was linguistics. And in, in linguistics, I learned, because in the 70s, there was a big moment around race and language. And they were like, black English is actually real English. 
And they were like, so kids can actually, it's eubonics, and kids can actually write in it and use it in school, and we're not going to fix their English. We're going to let them use their own. And when I heard that, I thought, well, then what about my English? You know, because I think, I think there's a whole normative white middle class um, language, you know, and other white languages are kind of jokey and dialects and stuff. And, but there is a sense, I think, probably more in, in people of color and pe people where English, if English is a second language, that you can use other Englishes. That's interesting and, and a commodity even in a certain way. But like white, if you're white, you got to be white, you know. And, and I feel like part of, for me, a lot of my work about class, which what I think is interesting, is how much everybody's English is a pastiche, and to use all that, and to use that bare naked, but also use the language of an intellectual and, um, and then, it, you know, a, a, an educated person. And so it's just, it's always, so I feel like, you know, it's always like, I mean, I got Chelsea Girls published because of Charles Bukowski. It's weird. The publisher who picked me up thought, we've got a female Bukowski now, yay. Mm -hmm. You know, because it was booze and girls and, you know. But, I mean, and I don't dislike Bukowski, but he was the cash cow for that press. And so they could publish me. I mean, this is, this is going off for a second, but I think this is so funny. The reason I got published was because of Charles Bukowski, which is really great. The reason I got published by HarperCollins was uh, Anthony Bourdain. Because there was a poetry editor who discovered Anthony Bourdain and published those books, and he made a lot of money for HarperCollins. So he could publish anything he wanted, including me. You know, and that's, so I think there are these men. This is not the answer to your question at all, but I think it's so funny. No. These guys, these are my cash cows. These are my, these are my bitches. Yeah. You know? I, I think this is clearly the answer they want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but th th there is a way in which class, I think, so saturates our collective lives, but we don't quite have the language to talk about it because we're not supposed to talk about that language, right? It's because, you know, you can always move up in classes in very easy ways. Uh, and it's always kind of thought of it in terms of content. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to tell a working class story yeah. rather than speaking an, an, a working class um, idiolect. Idiolect, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I wanted to ask in some ways about, you know, you work through different genres and you move through different genres very easily, right? And how do you do that? Like, how do you, how do you go from poetry to novel to cultural criticism to back to poetry? Is there, tell me about kind of what that creative work is like. I mean, it's very slow, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I wanted to write a novel, and it took me, like, 14 years. Mm -hmm. um, because I think you don't get confidence right away. Like, you have to do something repeatedly, you know? So, like, the first novel took a really long time because I didn't know I could write a book of prose, you know? So I wrote 10 pages, and I thought, oh, good, I can write 10 pages. And then I could write 20 pages. Good, I can do that again, you know? And so building the book was something that happened over years. Um, but other things, I mean, often things are commissioned and mm -hmm. asked for. Like, if somebody says, do you want to write a libretto? I was like, hell yes. Like, you've been waiting. It's sort of like a date. You've been waiting for somebody to ask for that. You know, so I'd lo a lot of my moving around, or the same with art writing. Like, I love looking at art, and, but I didn't know that I, I knew people, but I didn't know I could do it. And th there was a person, a man named Rene Ricard, who was in, he was in the, the Warhol film, Chelsea Girls, and he was an art critic and a friend of mine and a poet. And he did a performance at the Guggenheim, and he was like, you will write about it for Art in America. And I was like, what? You know? And he kind of made me do it. He just badgered me into doing it. You know? And then I had the experience of like 400 words equals $100. You know? And that was more than I got for <laughs> writing poems. And more people read my art review than ever read my poems. And then painters started to come to my readings. So it just kind of changed. So each genre brings wow. you and drops you into a whole other world. And I like travel, and I like other worlds. And so I think it's it's you know it's economic and it's it's um, just opportunities come. Yeah, you know when I was reading through um, the Morts of Being Iceland, which is a kind of incredible book on travel and cultural criticism. What I was enjoying particularly about reading that book and those essays was. I was approaching these moments of art saying, okay, this is 
what Eileen Miles has to say about this, and I'm going to go spend this time doing this, right? Mm -hmm. In a way, I, I think of you as a poet, as a, as a prose writer, but also as a cultural critic, and I'm wondering if in 2023, when I think in essence everyone is a cultural critic, right, right. and everyone kind of feels very confident about being a cultural critic, what does it mean to write cultural criticism? I mean, I think it's to become less lonely because I think we're all feeling so isolated because I know this and this and this and this and this, but nobody else goes all to all these same places, mm -hmm. you know? And so you always think you're in your own little culture that isn't necessarily, like you might know somebody in each of these places, but you don't know. It, whereas when I was younger, it was like such a mass culture thing. You know, I like my generation, I'm a, I'm a boomer. You know, I would go to a rock concert and I went to Woodstock. You know I mean? It was just like, there were so many of us at the same thing. And I think by now with the internet and just so many kinds of, like what was the great, it was this guy who used to be the editor at Art Forum, like way back. And he said the thing about postmodernism, he said, all styles, all styles apply and the only real time is now, mm. you know? And we kind of live in this place in this way. And so I think we're all cultural critics because we all have these amazing lists. And then when you have an opportunity to expose your list, it's so exciting because then you find out that your list is actually a very shared thing too. You know? So you kind of break down the hermetic thing of, of yeah. your own particular weird taste. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, I, wanna, I have more questions, but I want to hear your questions. But I've always wanted to play a word game. So can we do a quick word game? I'm just going to give you names, and you're just going to give me very brief responses. Okay. One word responses. Is that, is that, are we good with that? There are 10 of them? Sure. All right. Ernest Hemingway. Huh. <laughs> I thought you you like, have to do this faster. I kind of thought, duh. But I actually really like Ernest Hemingway. I think he's a great writer. Yeah. Trees? Trees? Yeah. Best thing in the world. Boston? Boston. Um, home? California? Um, love it, but, but feel depressed here. <laughs> Gertrude Stein? The best. The best. The teacher. The ultimate teacher. Jim Jordan? June Jordan. No, sorry. Not June Jordan. Jim Jordan. Jim Jordan, as in Kool-Aid and, and Jim... Oh, the, oh, Paul. Oh, oh, I was thinking of, I was thinking of the guy who had everybody kill themselves at once in, in, in Ghana. <laughs> Jim Jordan, I barely know enough about this idiot to even want to honor the name. Okay. Though we have somebody even worse now, right? Yeah, we do. Whoa. 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 I yeah. know. Taylor Swift? Across the street. Yeah. Right? Alan Isn't Gins she here tonight? I think it's just for the movie, alas. Oh, oh okay. I was, I was like, is she here? I did see her once at a concert. It was amazing. How, was it good? Um, the concert was great, and it was amazing. She was, Richard Hell organized it, and so she, Taylor Swift, was coming up to Richard Hell on the side to tell him how much she liked this singer. It was amazing. Hmm. I was like, this does not make sense. Okay. <laughs> Three more. Allen Ginsberg? Oh, love, love. Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, I mean, he, I met him when I was in my 20s, and he was so generous and kind to me, mm -hmm. and he was such a great, um, he, was, he was amazing. He was like a world maker. You know, and a model for what a poet can be. Television. It educated me, taught me about the world, you know, brought me to New York, you know. Reincarnation? Why not? <laughs> yeah. Questions? He's going to pass yeah, around the mic. Yeah, he's going to pass around the mic. Please, please, we'd love to hear your questions. Can I have a question? Can I just give you my own? Okay. I'm going to ask you about books. But if you want to be on the recording, is that the reason to use the mic? No. Yeah. Take my finger out. Yeah. So forever. Okay, as a writer, I want to ask you about books. Yeah. Now, some writers, they work in a very spare room with a spare, you know, an empty desk kind of a thing. I, I find that. Uh, odd but unusual and but you know interesting but are you surrounded by books do you have a lot of books what's your do oh you, yeah how do you yeah categorize them in your your residence do you what's your relationship you know with i mean i love books and i love to have piles of books around me at all times and there's always like a um 
like a community of books that define a time for me. That it's like, and some of them are books I need to read, I want to read, I mean to read, and some of them are books that I sort of never get to, but I should read, and then others are, you know. So it's, it's and it, it makes travel hard because I really like to travel with a lot of books, and I'm always shipping box. Like I live in Texas and I live in New York, and I'm always shipping boxes of books and. And people send me, by being a writer, you get sent a lot of books, both to blurb and just to read. And, and that's, it's really fun because the, and my bookshelves are really chaotic, really a mess. And so books will live on the bookshelf for a while. Like I'll get a galley and I'll think, that sounds interesting, but I'm not going to blurb that book and I can't read, read that right now. And then I put it on the shelf. And then they just, you know, it's so great cruising your own bookshelves. And thinking, oh, I'm going to read that now, you know, and, and it being a completely wonderful experience, you know. Like I'm reading a book right now um, called Brown Neon by Raquel Gutierrez. And, um, right, great, great book. And it was, it came to me, well, first of all, I love the cover and I love the title. And it was, a, it was a galley, so the idea was blurb it. And I thought, I'm not going to do that, you know. And then I put it away. And then just by chance, we've met and we've become friends. And I'm going to take a vacation with a gang. Anyway, I'm reading her book right now. And it's just like I love reading books at the wrong time. I feel like there's nothing more violating than the feeling. Like I found college horrible because there was the reading list. And I was an English major. And you just were like, read a lot and read the books that other people wanted you to read in that order. And it made me read so slow. And I feel like it took years to get back the kind of voluminous reading pattern that is, you know, and I read faster now than I ever did, you know, I love to read. So it's a, a reading is the best. I like reading more than writing. Yeah. Um, thank you for being here today. And um, just thank you for uh, always speaking truth on your Instagram and um, just in the heart of empire at I feel like it's important and it's been nice to see. Um, but I guess my question is about um, writing prompts. Like, I really liked your dog poem. Um, do you ever give yourself prompts or or do you like prompts? Often? Oh, yeah. No, I give myself prompts all the time, you know, and then sometimes they fail. But often, you know, I mean, I think a novel is a series of prompts, you know, and, and you have to figure out the right prompt. And because and, sometimes you'll go off in a direction and it's just it's like, there's nothing there, you know, it was just a good idea. But, because I think that's the way, you know, we learn, we go to workshops mostly and they tell you what to do and you're like, mm -hmm. you know, and then it's so funny, you do, I see that happen when I teach and, and people do this thing they don't want to do and then they have this amazing experience, you know, and then I think the rest of your life, your career is just a series of you putting yourself in a workshop and, and assigning yourself sh stuff and, and reading lists. Like I usually, when I'm writing a book, I have ideas about, what I should read for this book. And I don't even know why sometimes, you know, but it's really fun to, I can read this, I can't read that, you know, and what's in and what's out. It's very particular. Yeah. Hi, thanks for Hello. the reading and the talk. Um, I especially loved your use of the first person when you talked about hating to do dishes. And um, <laughs> I think that sometimes the news you bring from the quote unquote other world tells us about like Could the Could you world. say that last part louder? I oh, that I, part, you that, that about question yeah. about poetry bringing news from a different world. Um, one of the things I appreciate about reading your work is sometimes I just feel like it's the world I'm already in. Uh -huh. um, and that has to do with uh, dogs. And um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your relationship to dogs in writing. And um, I'm kind of thinking also about a piece of yours that I read, and I'm blanking on the title now, but you talk about there's a cat on an airplane and you go to like interact with the cat and you kind of make this, if I recall correctly, an observation about animals and identity and how it creates these spaces for relation. Could you say more about that? I, yeah, <laughs> no, it's, it's, the, the cat in the airplane sounds kind of familiar, but I can't quite pull that one up. But um, 
I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I can only say the most obvious things. I mean, but, but animals, are, you know, well, it's, it's a nonverbal relationship, even though, you know, it's shaped by language and they know a certain, I mean, animals know more words than we realize, you know, but it still is, it still is, you know, my animal self with their animal self, you know, and that's really the, the nature of it. And you don't really, you know, I mean, like, I think we have those relationships with other human beings, but they're hard to have. You know, and with animals, that's that's what that's what you get. You know, and they're all. It's so great that they're all so radically different. In the same way that you know, people of my generation, they used to try and make kids eat certain foods. You know, nobody. You know, I think people are much more permissive with kids and understand that kids are somebody. You know, but when I was young, the idea was you were nobody in particular, so eat your squash. Mm -hmm. You know. And, and I have those experiences with my dog. I'm always, like, trying to make her be some other dog because I knew some dog that, like, I love pears. And I knew a dog that loved pears. And it was great that we enjoyed this fruit. My dog does not. It was like, get that thing away from me. You know, it's so interesting to see who, who they are slowly. And, and you know, my, I've had two pit bulls, and they're completely different personalities, you know. And um, I don't know. It's just like the... the having the patience. I, also, I feel like a, like a failed human in a certain way because I've had, you know, an excess of relationships two years, four years, you know, I've never gotten past that, you know. And so it's almost like a joke in my life at this point. Like, a, I'm in my 70s and I'm like going to have a long-term relationship now, like, till I'm 100 with somebody, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just, it seems, but then I realize I've had 25 years with dogs, 25 mm -hmm. really intimate years. Mm -hmm. And they, they, it's strange to realize that they know me in a certain way, probably more than anybody does, you know, and it's, it's held and then it, you know, it's invisible and it vanishes and there's no record of it. And there's something so beautiful about that, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, animals are, and, and, you know, it's again, as a culture, the fact that we in America still routinely, we call it euthanize. We kill, mm -hmm. we, we exterminate mm -hmm. animals, you know, and not even because they're unwell, just because, you know, we don't have any more cages. You know, mm -hmm. so we're just going to get rid of them, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it, it's shocking. It's shocking mm -hmm. that that's considered doable, right? you know, and even the language. So disgust. people walk into a shelter and say, put my dog to sleep. Mm -hmm. And they do. You know, that's crazy. It was like they walk in with a child and say, kill my kid. You know, it was mm -hmm. like, no, no, we're not going to kill your kid, you know, but it'll, they'll kill your dog. Right. And yeah, it's, it's really, um, anyway. Thanks. It's a, one of the many places to care. Right. And if they inhabit your life, they inhabit your poems. That's just the fact, you know. Um, so I have to go in like 0. 0.2 seconds because my dad is visiting, but uh, <laughs> I was hoping to get in a question. We all have to go. <laughs> Thank you We're for We're a little over time. But, uh, so I wrote my first poem in second grade and kind of was chugging ever since, you could say. <laughs> Um, and in over the quarantine when I was 15, I, I got published and it's like, whoa, cool, published. Uh, and I'm 18 now and it's like, it's kind of a weird like dissonance, I guess. Like, um, I, you know, I'm still writing and it's still enjoyable, but it's like, I, I don't know about, it's not really quality, but it's more like publishability, if that makes sense. Like, I feel like there's some writings that are considered like, okay, yeah, you could publish this. And then I, I don't know, I feel like it's just been interesting, you know, having writing evolve, my writing evolve in that way that's like, is it no longer like, you know, acceptable? I don't know, I don't really know how to phrase that question. Do, but like, do, do you mean you've become less publishable? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, maybe in, maybe in publisher's eyes. Oh, I, I, I think that you should just forget about publishing for a while and just please yourself. Sure. You know? And think about your friends. Like you have writer friends, yes. right? I think they're the most important people. You know, because they're the real audience and they will really affect you and they will really hear your work and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think think about think about that network and not thinking so much about publishing. Because I think publishing really is like a, a bane on writers' backs. And it really, it's like I'm writing a big giant novel right now and I feel like I'd be really so messed up if I had to think about who was going to publish it. You yeah. know, it's just like, because then you start squirming, trying to please people and stuff. You're probably going someplace really interesting and you just don't fit into the categories you used to fit into, like young genius. Yeah. You're becoming a slightly <laughs> an old 18 year old genius. Yeah, you know? I'm ancient now. Yeah, All right, yeah thank you. I have to yeah. go. But look at your community. Madame. Tell your dad hello. <laughs> 
this was wonderful. Yeah. Um, I think that'll be our last question. And um, it's kind of an ending and a beginning, I have a feeling. Um, but thank you so much, all of you here, clearly so engaged and such a trust that's built in this conversation. And Samir, thank you for your wonderful questions. And Eileen, the reading has an energy that will stay with me. And um, I have to say that question about the dogs and your poetry about the dogs. Um, it is amazing how kind and yet unkind we can be to them and to each other. So this afternoon has just um, been a reminder of how much fun it can be to be human and real. And so thank you for being here. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for reading books and poetry. And thank you for always being willing to come and, and ask questions that bring out the best. So it's been a joy. And buy books. They're right out there. Thank you.